Hello, how are you doing? Hi, Jeff. <clears throat> I'm, I'm all right, except my sinuses are telling me we're in for a big change in the weather. Yeah, I caught a cold, I don't know, Thursday or Friday, and then my mom caught it. and I kind of got over it yesterday, and she's kind of getting it over today. <clears throat> but you're right. With, but with the allergies, it kind of makes it hard to tell when the cold is over. As long as it's just a cold or just, just a cold or allergies. Yeah. Yeah. St. Ambrose just switched over to masks optional today. Wow. Although professors reserve the right to continue to require them in their own classes. So what's that mean for uh, the club meeting back at Ambrose again? I don't know. I, I could ask, I could ask around. See if, see if visitors would still need to check in. Yeah, the check-in is the only hard part. Mm -hmm. so making masks mandatory, I don't think is all that big of a deal. They won't like it, but it's not, you know, it's just hard going over, you know, across campus to get out and check in and get back in and drive in to go over to the other building. I write myself a note to uh, ask about that. If I can get at my notes, hang on a minute. <laughs> yeah, I need to open up an email too. Oh, oh, wait, maybe that's what I need. Yay, Sam is here. There he is.
Sam. Sam, you there? Maybe you want to bring back a coffee. Hmm. Or maybe his cat lured him away. Could be. Oh, hi, Alan. Hi, Alan. Hello there. How's it going? So far, so good. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> nice sunspots. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, Robert, I think that might be the uh, sunspot cluster that uh, might have been the site of that uh, solar flare. That big one, yeah. Yeah. So we'll have to see. Maybe we'll get another solar flare here when it's right front and center, and then we could be in for uh, real uh, pandemonium here. I'm going to back up all my files before then. Yeah, better back everything up and, and uh, get it inside your Faraday cage. Hmm. <laughs> if, if I can find one, I'm gonna hurry up and make one. Yeah. Get in. Maybe you could just get in your car. That'd probably be close enough. Yeah. You can always buy lots of aluminum foil. <laughs> I've got. I've got aluminum foil. Yeah. Well, just covered and cover the walls of your of your apartment with aluminum foil. There you go. What if aluminum siding counts? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it probably does. Yeah, the building um, where I work has a. Uh, has Wi-Fi and it has everything in, and still my phone has a real tough time getting any type of connection. It's it's just one of those buildings that it's all a you know metal structure with with the um, gypsum board walls. So I'd be I'm pretty sure that reduces reception a lot. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I heard one of the guys that I work with, it's going, it's going to school at St. Ambrose, and he said that St. Ambrose just went to uh, mask our, uh, at your discretion. Is that right? Mask optional began today. Does that mean that they are, that, that the restrictions for uh, the screening are a lot less and we could start meeting at the, Jeff and I were just wondering about that. I'm gonna, I'm, I gotta remember to email and ask specifics about that. See if the see if the visitors policy policies changed also. Hmm. I wonder. Let's see. Let me check Ambrose's website. See if. There's anything. Uh, my Sarah candidate for station. Hmm, I wonder where. I wonder where COVID policies would be stored under. Uh, 
extracurricular activities? I don't know. Uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, maybe not, maybe not university services. QC community, no. They might not have it updated yet either. Well, but you know, the state of Illinois is going to mask optional on the 28th. Can I, so I don't know, I'm still trying to figure out if everybody's gonna follow that or are they just going to stick to what they got. I'm, DR hasn't said anything yet, so we're still wearing masks when we walk around. And let's see. I, found, I, found, I just found the COVID section. Uh, be safe, academic support. It says academic supports. Oh, it's for syllabi blended I see you COVID website page uh Prepare for your visit to campus. For, okay, prepare for your visit to campus. Uh, wearing a face mask indoors is optional now. Uh, visitors must monitor their health on a daily basis for any symptoms and stay home if you are ill. Pretty much nothing different here. Well, but do they still have the screening stations that they used to have? If they don't, obviously it's 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 an honor system. Well, you wouldn't come if you're sick, right? I don't see anything here about it either way. I, I I better email tomorrow just to make sure. Yeah, it would be nice if we could go back to the room instead of mm. trying to, uh, well, we never did use the, the hotel that much anyway. So Robert, maybe you can ask them if there's still a check-in, ask them if we can just check into our room and you can turn in like the attendance sheet if all they wanna know is who is there. They might be okay with something like that. Uh, let me see. Uh, see, ask if there's ask if it's okay to just check in at the meeting room and send a an attendance an attendance list. So, so right now I know myself ask if visitors still have to check in before going on campus. And that means we can return uh, to uh, having our meetings there. So I ask if they're still doing check-in stations. And so I'm assuming that's the main thing. Now, if we do go, if we are able to go back to the room on campus, we'll have to figure out how we're going to keep doing the virtual component. You're muted. Maybe if we just have a 
computers sitting toward the face in front of the room facing in so the camera catches people. And my microphone worked really well for a coin club meeting last Thursday. I can double check if the classroom computers have cameras. I need to double check that. There, Ed, most, most of them are the all in uh, versions now. Yeah. And that might not work too well anyway, because the monitor is facing probably not necessarily the best direction. They're not actually fixed to the podiums. I mean, they can be turned. Oh, I thought it was built into the computer monitor, like on our laptops. Oh, you mean the cameras? Yeah, but you're going to always use an external camera, like a, like a webcam or something. Anybody have one? I got one mounted in here. I'm not using it right now. Nobody's. Hmm. You can always use, you can also use a DSLR with the right adapter. Yeah, you gotta have the right adapter. Mm. And you gotta have the right software. But yeah, I can. it can do that. And there's a thought that you'd have to load the software onto the, you load, load the webcam software onto the computers there. And I don't know that Campus, you probably couldn't do that on campus without an administrator's, administrator's password. Well, I, I, I still think if we just set a computer, uh, a laptop up front on the table underneath the screen, the camera will be pointing toward the audience. So and then if I brought my external microphone, it will cover, you know, that classroom with anybody talking. So, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, yeah. And actually, that's better because then that would leave the, classroom computer free for doing presentations. And I could bring this little speaker to us loud enough to cover that room for anybody that wanted to talk that was uh, attending virtually. Sure. Yeah. It's off. Hmm? I don't suppose we got a check from Mid American Energy yet, did we? Uh, I have. I'm, I'm forget, I forgot. Well, to check, I haven't checked the mail lately. I didn't check the mail last week. But the last time I went there, which was like the Thursday of the week before, or something like that, there was nothing. I was going to go tomorrow. Um, I should probably I get it. I uh, should probably get a key because I work like three blocks from there. Well, uh, we got I, two keys. I've got one. Yeah, I got the other, but one of us. I don't, know if, the, I don't know if the post off. I think the. I think Jim is the one that requested it. And I thought that, I don't know if he had to pay for it or not. I thought he did, but I don't know how much. Can't remember. I don't think he gave me a, an invoice or anything for that. But anyway, so the biggest issue is if any one of you guys uh, go and get the mail, I still have to get it from you. So it doesn't save me anything. I still have to go somewhere. You're muted. Muted. I think it would save a lot because instead of you driving there to find out there's nothing, and uh, my place is a lot closer to you than St. Ambrose is. So instead of you uh, going over to find out we got some kind of a periodical or nothing at all, you'd only have to meet up if there was something important. 
Okay. Well, up to you. you it's, can it's have so my key. Since if I if I don't drive out there that often, I I don't need it. One one of us will get a key to you, Jeff. Yeah, and again, the main reason is. It's easy for me to get there, and I, you know, I don't know what time you get done with your the school day, Robert. But don't they close the lobby like at five? Um, a, a lobby. Oh, the at the the, the 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 post office lobby. At I well, my my day ends differently on different days of the week. Yeah, I usually always... really get there like at four. I leave work like about. It takes me about 20 minutes to cross town to get there, 20, 25 minutes. And most, I, most days, most days I can be done by four. Although tomorrow we've got a department meeting that goes till after five o'clock. So can't do it. So I can't do it. Can't do it then. Yeah, I'm most always done at 345 and it takes me five minutes to get there. So I was going to go tomorrow after work. I think I don't have anything. Well, it all depends on the weather, but uh, mm. I was going to go uh, to check if you want to meet there tomorrow or sometime between four and five, then I can check and if, if and then you can keep the key. Um, like you said, it depends on the weather. I'm planning on uh, if the weather is decent, I'm going to go out to Walton and drop off a camera so that they can ship it in for fixing. Okay. So I'll be I'll be leaving for there, but if the weather is bad, I'm not going to go out there. Okay. But if the if the weather is bad, you probably don't want to come in anyway. So it all depends on. Well, you know, they they were talking about that that freezing rain, so I don't know how slippery. It's I I think that's only to be north of the north of the Quad Cities. Well, yeah, I'll I'll text you tomorrow. Although the, te the temperature is supposed to drop below freezing by tomorrow evening. So right. whatever rain does end up on the roads probably is probably going to freeze over. Well, I expect to be home way before five. Because once, uh, once I get there, uh, I grab whatever, I just turn around and I get on 280 and I'm, I'm home in no time. Depends, depends when the depends when we get true. Byron. Hello. Hi. How are we doing? Oh, okay. Discussing the weather. Rusty. Mitchell? Byron, Rusty? Hey, Hello. Byron. Hello. Hello. Jeff? John Boy? Billy Bob? <laughs> Big Bob, Little Bob? Jeff? Oh, Jeff? I have a question for you. <laughs> okay. Um, since I've, I've texted you a couple times about it and, and you never answered me back, you still want to sell that stuff for me on Friday nights? I remember us talking about it. I remember seeing a text, but yeah, what all do you have again? I forgot. Um, there's like three, three finder scopes. That are complete. Um, oh, I have to go through the list, but no, there's probably about a half a dozen things. Okay, can I do a few at a time? Sure. I mean, I just, I mean, I can just bring them over, and when you get them done, you get them done. Do them as you want. Okay, we'll work that. We'll start with the three finder scopes. They're pretty easy. Yeah. 
Okay. I'll get you in. We'll get them. I'll get them over to you. Or whatever. Meet you somewhere. Yeah, I can meet you after work uh, this this coming week. Or, you know, I didn't go to work today, but I'll be there this week. Yeah. Well, I got class Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So I don't know what time you get off. What time you get off? 3.45. Okay. I can still meet you. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Uh, yeah. Tomorrow's not the best day. Um, yeah. I'm working on my camper tomorrow, so. Okay. So maybe Wednesday th Wednesday or Thursday, we'll sure. meet up and I'll grab the three uh, finder scopes from you. Okay. Just kind of let me know what you want for each one of them so I can okay. mark them. Yeah, I'm not really sure. You know, they were like, well, I don't know. I'll have to look them up again and find out what they're going for. So, <clears throat> all right. Okay. Thanks. Travis O. I wonder who that is. It's a mystery to everyone. <clears throat> Travis O. That will probably be Travis Ortel. Don't you don't tell. It's a secret. <laughs> oh, hi, Jeff. Hi, everyone. So what did you think? Well, well, we'll wait for uh, to talk about it later because I know that you broke out your scope and saw Ryan. We'll talk about it later. Yeah, sure thing. Rolando. Rolando. Howdy. Oops. There, there you are. He's open. Excuse me. Travis, Rolando, how's it going? Not too bad. Pretty nice outside. Backyard's kind of pretty well back here. Backyard's kind of squishy still, but squishy as in slush. Yeah, kind of muddy or mud. Oh, yeah. Snow's all gone. It's just. Mm. Spongy. Yes. I was saying we might get some later this week, a little bit. <laughs> like I've said, how much? <coughs> Hi, Mike. Hi. Hello. Hmm. Kind of looks like Brady Bunch now. Or Celebrity Squares. Well, for, my, for my arrangement, that, Rusty, that makes you Alice. <laughs> hey, Paul. Or it did, or it did, until, I, or did until Paul joined. jeez. Oh, I didn't think Alice had a beard. Maybe not on her face. <laughs> huh? I'm not touching that. No. <laughs> TV not. makeup artists, they can hide anything. Yeah. <laughs> Howdy, Cecil. 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 Hmm. Cute cat. Uh. 
You gonna turn them into earmuffs? Well, I got seven o'clock. So do I. I have I have a motion to declare that it's seven o'clock. Yep. How many seconds? Let her rip. Um, it's about forty-eight seconds. I only have thirty-four. <laughs> okay. Anyway, I think we'll, so we're all agreed it can start the meeting now. Okay. Yep. All right. Except that we lost Mike. I'm back. Okay. <laughs> all right. And we are recording the meeting, so please try to watch your language. Although when I post this on YouTube, I don't specify this made for kids, so I guess it doesn't matter. <clears throat> All right. Uh, did everyone get the agenda that I sent out? Yes. Most of you did, okay. Yes, sir. So, hmm? Where's where? <laughs> if you didn't, say no or forever hold your peace. Okay, so the first item on the agenda is a format for future meetings. Some of us before the meeting started were discussing that St. Ambrose University just switched over to masks being optional indoors and out. And we're wondering if the visitor policy had also been changed. I'm gonna contact them tomorrow and see if there has been, uh, see if visitors are still required to check in at various places on campus before before entering. And if not, then we could look in the possibility of going back there for uh, society meetings again. I think we talked about starting them up in uh, April again, possibly. That's when we were talking about doing uh, the hybrid meetings from the Doubletree Hotel. Oh, okay. <clears throat> yeah. Um, and also, there's a new policy at St. Ambrose, so that changes things too. So, doesn't necessarily, I mean, well, it doesn't necessarily change that we wait until April to do it. I mean, we'd still, I mean, we'd still have to get the room reserved for those Monday evenings, and I don't know how long it, that process would take. So, we'll we'll keep the. Uh, We'll keep the society up to date on our efforts. Hi, Ron. Good evening, gentlemen. How's everything tonight? Gentlemen. Who'd you yes. <laughs> Must be looking at the wrong face or you know, the wrong Zoom, I guess. Hmm. All right. Okay, so next item, past events. We had a public night on February 5th. 
it was all virtual due to weather and to probable uh, ground conditions of the observatory. And actually la lasted for more than two hours. We had a, quite a long uh, talk. Um, some some visitors were asking, uh, who, Jeff, ref refresh my memory, who was it who was asking about uh, advice for uh, getting their camera hooked up to uh, their telescope? I think a lot of that was um, Byron Nelson Perez from uh, yeah, the, the yeah, View yes. Club. Yes, yes, he was there. So not much viewing that night, but then uh, let me excellent here real quick. Uh, I'll say it real quick. Of course, the computer takes forever. Um, yep. Um, you know, I got a club. Alan, did PAC have a club meeting on the 14th? Yeah. Yeah, we had a, we had a meeting. We had a, uh, a hybrid meeting, uh, kind of like what you, what you guys are talking about. Uh, we had a Zoom component plus a in-person component there at the Butterworth Center. And we had a... Uh, uh, speaker, what was her name? Uh, Jen Owen. Jen Owen. From who, Michigan State University. Yeah, from Michigan State University. Talked about how birds navigate the uh, skies. The uh, birds, a lot of birds uh, migrate at night and they use the stars in, uh, to navigate. And they did a lot of experiments where they put birds in, in special circular cages that were open at the top. They were screened, of course, but the birds could see uh, out of the cages. And they put them in uh, planetariums <clears throat> and uh, showed them the sky. And uh, the birds were uh, would attempt to fly in the uh, direction that they needed to fly for that time of the year. So it was <laughs> kind of in, kind of interesting. It was it was very interesting. Birds are a lot smarter than uh, the average person <laughs> from from an astronomical point of view, perhaps. So what's uh, guiding them? The stars? Yeah, yeah, the stars. Hmm. What about cloudy nights? Well, they don't. They don't necessarily uh, always move. It depends on the, uh, you know, atmospheric conditions. If it's too windy, they won't. They won't fly. Uh, I don't know if, uh, if they're not able to see the sky at all. They they still use nearest magnetic field as well. Mm -hmm. as yes, I've heard that. And uh, they also are able to uh, recognize uh, landmarks as well if they've been there before. So a lot of birds uh, are familiar with the territory that they're navigating. But uh, if they put them inside of a, a planetarium and show them the sky from a planetarium, they get the birds to fly in, the, uh, in whatever direction they want by, by just uh, rotating the view. Hmm. So it's pretty, it's pretty interesting. So it suggests birds do have long-term memories. Yeah, and they may, in fact, be born with uh, knowledge. Hmm. And one of, the, one of the questions was, well, what about, uh, you know, as you have precession of the <laughs> Earth's axis? Uh, yeah. Birds know that. Well, I don't know. There's a lot of questions, but... Uh, <laughs> Evidently, uh, they're tuned into the uh, orientation of the sky as it currently is. I don't think a bird is going to be around after 26,000 years to notice the difference. <laughs> it's, it's probably a gradual learning process. Mm. But anyway, yeah, there's, uh, that was, it was pretty interesting. Mm. Pretty interesting talk. All right.
Uh, now, upcoming events. Um, QCAS has a public night on March 5th. Well, we'll, we'll want to have a virtual component of that too, but we want to try for in person at the university, or do we think it's still going to be too, might still be too muddy or cold at that time? I think we still need to play it by ear a little bit. I can keep in touch with Jay Mercy out there. See see what he see what he's noticed. And then too many different notes up here. Uh, Pack has another meeting on March fourteenth. Right. And that, that's going to be a uh, smorgasbord meeting. So that coincides with PAC's uh, business meeting. We have quarterly business meetings, un unlike QCAS, that has a business meeting every time. Mm -hmm. uh, PAC, PAC only does it quarterly. But uh, assuming that the business meeting consumes uh, some time, uh, typically then what we do is have a smorgasbord of short topics. Um, we usually don't have an invited speaker. It'll it'll be uh, club members uh, mm -hmm. doing the talks. So that's that's uh, the next meeting. When 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 did you say that was March fourteenth, uh, right? The fourteenth. That's what I've got. Yeah, I think that's right. That's a Monday night, mm -hmm. and that'll be at the Butterworth Center, uh, or there'll be a Zoom component there as well. And then uh, the 19th, which is uh, the Saturday following, that is our first public uh, NIABI viewing night, if the weather allows it. Hmm. Okay. So that, okay. So mark that March 19th possible, Ni possible pack night at NIABI. And then QSAS is having its Messier Marathon scheduled for April 2nd. Any updates on uh, any updates on that? Nope, but it should be a good to go unless the weather's bad. So uh, conditions should be fine at Mankey unless we get a real late snow. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think we're going to run in the cold. We usually do. We might run into some cloudy weather, but we'll have to play that by ear a bit. What's the date on that? April 2nd. Yeah. Should be warming up by then. Quite excited to check it out this year. Glad to have it's you. a lot of fun. Yeah. Yep. A lot of fun. I hope I can get my baiter by then. It would be perfect, I think, for that. Remind me, and I'll bring one out to you if uh, you don't have it by then. Oh, that's generous of you. Thanks. All right. And now, at our last business meeting, we got to wondering, uh, discussing possibly having some public star parties close to the Quad Cities in hopes of attracting more, more of the uh, more casual visitors. And we uh, talked a little bit about some possible places we can investigate. Let's see, what was uh, some of the places we were looking at? My computer is being frustratingly slow today. Yeah, while you're looking for that, a couple ideas would be uh, the park up here on the hill in Riverdale lets us do stuff like that. And also downtown Davenport at the levee, Matt Nielsen and I did uh, some stuff down there at night. It's pretty bright, but uh, there's a lot of people walking around down there. So that was kind of fun. What about also, West School, um, sorry. out there on the West End on Highway 6? There's a ball diamond set up out there. It's by that new uh, National Guard base. They have LED lighting, but it's spacing di directly down. So there's not a lot of pollution. 
but straight out, it's pretty good. Of course, you go to the east, you're going to have the Quad City Lights. You go to the west or northwest, you have I-80, but due south and straight up, it's fairly good. Uh, and that's got a big parking lot. Yeah, that's the West High School. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> easily accessible from the highway and much darker. Uh, I think that would be easy for people to come and go from there too. Mm -hmm. yeah, decent sized parking lot. So <clears throat> I go out there occasionally and set up in the parking lot myself. They never kick me out, but you're going to have a public event. There'd have to be someone contacted. Now we could uh, have a thing with West like we do with Pleasant Valley and Bettendorf. We also floated around North Scott High School, uh, Lost Grove Lake, and not exactly QC, but Walcott Junior High or someplace in DeWitt. I mean, at least the, those would be in town. So there's like, like maybe get a few more people there. So uh, a number of just so several different places were floated around. Can't do them all in uh, one season, but if we just get a couple of them and expose ourselves out there, I think it would be good. Let people, let people know, know in no uncertain terms that we do exist, yes. And we can do some of these kind of impromptu. They don't have to be on a scheduled night necessarily. Um, the, the downtown Davenport one that we did, Matt and I just showed up there and we probably had 30 people walking around just that just came by. And uh, that was just kind of a, a whim that we did. We can also do that same thing during the day. If we bring solar scopes, just set up downtown Davenport, downtown Bettendorf, you know, or, you know, any, any place up by North Park Mall wherever we want to. And then, like I say, you can always invite them to uh, come out to uh, uh, the Minky site, you know, for additional viewing and yeah. so. Yeah, hand out flyers with a map in our, on our calendar on it. Yeah. And yeah, how, how many flyers do we have on, on hand? You know, um, Back when I was president, we started built, putting together a new trifold, and I don't think that we ever printed any off, but I've, we've got a new trifold with uh, membership information and club information on it. Uh, we could get that back out next board meeting. I could send that to you guys. We could tweak on it and maybe uh, get those printed out with a, a map and a, and a 2022 calendar on it. And all we'd have to do is update the calendar each year. That's good. That's a good idea. Yeah. I just like the idea. It's all asphalt road out there now. No gravel. Beautiful. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, Jeff, can you get that? Uh, make make a note for yourself. Get that. Send that to us in the next board meeting. Yeah, I, I've got it in my computer and in my cell phone. So, yeah. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Uh, are there any other upcoming events that we should uh, talk about? What, what about Astronomy Day in May? How, mu how much uh, planning should we do for that and how far ahead of time should we start planning? Okay, so that's, uh, that's May 7th. Where is yeah. that help? I can drop another line to Chris like, but he said uh, that they are game for it this year. And I think he's already got it penciled in, but uh, of, of course it was uh, pending whatever was going on with COVID, but no, like you, we were all talking about tonight, things have been changing rapidly. So uh, I think it'd be a good idea to contact me again, but it wouldn't be a bad idea to find out what club members can participate and what they want to do when they participate. Hmm. And I'll clarify that further. Uh, for those of you that don't 
don't know, uh, what we do for Astronomy Day is during the day we show up at Bettendorf High School and once in a while we've had some displays inside, displayed telescopes, displayed globes of uh, planets and moons and stuff, had posters put up. Um, Bettendorf opens up their planetarium uh, and has multiple shows during the day and we set up solar scopes outside. So uh, you can kind of do whatever you want to do if you want to bring a scope and set it up just for display inside uh, and talk to people about what it is and why you've selected that one. If you've got a solar scope, you can set it out up outside. Uh, Dr. Mitchell was bringing globes. Paul, it wasn't did you all also brought posters at one time, didn't you? Robert? Yeah, yes, yeah, one or two. Yeah. And so uh, we, we had some miscellaneous stuff out there. So uh, it's kind of, if you want to just show up to uh, be supportive and uh, hang out and just talk to people or just hang out and talk to other club members, that's great too. So uh, it'd be good to get a good showing. Uh, the last, what, three years we were kind of rained out? Yes, yeah. The first year we did it was pretty good. And then uh, we end that and then uh, we go out to uh, the observatory then and then guests are invited to go out and very seldomly do we get anybody to go out. But uh, during the day is at Bettendorf, during the night it would be at Mankey. Mm -hmm. And that night will be uh, a combined QCAS SAU public night. Yeah, I'm testing my microphone, which hasn't been functioning well. Sounds like it's working now, Cecil. Yeah, you know, there's there are a couple of, of good parks over in Bettendorf. There's one on 23rd, uh, it's, but it kind of sits at the bottom of the hill. Uh, then you've got that big park, I think what, Veterans Park or whatever. I mean, that's that's a nice big open space. So, you know, a couple of places there that wouldn't be, you know, wouldn't be too bad. So, so yes, Jeff, can you contact Chris and double check they can still be on for this year? Yep. Okay. And she sent out an email to the club asking who, who can be available on May 7th. So we just so we can start to get a head count. And it'd be a good, a good idea for the head count, it'd be a good idea to then pass on to Chris. So we're gonna have to have if anybody wants some tables set up and give Chris an idea of how many we'll need. Okay. Anything else? Let's see. All right. Next on the agenda. Anybody bought any new gear? That might possibly jinx our next public night. <laughs> <laughs> Already jinxed. When, it, when it's on the calendar, it's already jinxed. So I know I mentioned it before, yeah. but I did. Uh, I got the uh, Stellina, and it's still in the original packing box. Uh, Travis helped me uh, install an, an Android emulator on my Windows laptop so that I could use the uh, laptop to control the telescope instead of just depending on my cell phone. So. Uh, I actually planned on uh, opening up the box and videoing the opening uh, the last couple of days, but some other things came up and it just didn't happen. So uh, hopefully this week I'll be able to break it open. I get the feeling that I'll be able to try it out uh, here and maybe even have it running for the March 5th event. That'd be good. Yeah, very cool. I am still quite the uh, pessimist on it working at all. Okay, hey, Al, doesn't something like PAC have one of those they use? Roy. 
Yeah, Roy's got one. I think he's taking some decent shots with it. So, well, you know, it. it here's the thing that that uh, it is. Um, the shots are marginal at best, uh, even when you process them. Uh, much better can be done with the Rev Two. And a, a lot of the thought is that you don't have to. There's no setup. I mean, you don't have to polar align. You don't have to do any kind of multi-star alignment. You, you stick it on the tripod and you press a button and go. And, and that all is true, but it's really still not a public outreach tool because, you know, even for a cluster that's really bright that you point an eyepiece at and you see right away, it still takes you 15 minutes with the integration time to get a decent picture. It's something like Orion Nebula. You can really see that pretty decent through an eyepiece right away. And that's like 30 minutes. So it's not like a public tool where you can set it up and point at somebody and everybody can oom and ah instantaneously. M51, I think, takes an hour. So. Yeah, your Rev 2 would be better. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, you know, what you are saving is some setup and teardown time, but you are very much sacrificing any type of quality. And I guess my thought is if I'm going to wait to get an hour's worth of integration on M51, I don't think it's a big deal for me to spend 45 minutes setting up the gear to get something decent after that one hour. So do they market this thing as a, as a live uh, viewing? Yeah, and it does. I mean, you know, uh, you know, after the, it's, but it's a whole bunch of 10 second and you can't adjust the, uh, exposure time it's a whole bunch of 10 second of uh, frames elapsed and it and it high grades them so if it takes a shot that's bad it just removes it right away so you know it does a lot of cool stuff it's got a ro camera rotator in there so that's pretty cool it's got a a, a, a dew control system built in it it has a light pollution control built in it so it's got a lot of stuff but again you know if you're getting it for public outreach it's not a good thing, number one, because it takes too long for something to show up on the screen. If you're getting it because you want to take some good images, again, you're very limited. It's a little 80 millimeter F6 scope, and uh, it's only a doublet, so it's not even a triplet. And you're limited to what the camera is. You're limited to exposure time. So, you know, it's very limited if you're really wanting to take decent pictures. Um, it, it's kind of okay if you're wanting to do something like snapshots of stuff. And I've seen some pretty decent, you know, things taken from it. But, but you know, they, you know, you spend an hour's worth of integration time and then three hours with PixInsight or, or, uh, or, or Photoshop to get a decent picture when I can spend 45 minutes setting up some good gear and I don't even have to process the pictures when I'm done. So, you, you know, there are, again, trade-offs. I think it's a cool technology coming up, but um, a lot of the folks that are touting them kind of talk out both sides. Well, it's great for outreach because people can see it on the screen and you can share it with 20 other people. Well, sure, if you've got 20 people that want to stand there for an hour waiting to look at their cell phone, and, and that's not going to happen at a public event. So, um, again, it's an interesting thing to see, and I, I'm excited to see what it does and write a real review on the crazy thing, because uh, I, I really think that, you know, if someone wants a good picture, learn how to stick a Rev 2 on a, on a regular telescope, and for half the money, end up with three times the quality picture, you know. What other gear have people bought recently? I bought a used Canon T4i Astro Modified. I haven't had a chance to use it yet. I got a T3i Unmodified, and I got the T4i Modified. So when the weather improves, I want to see if there's any difference. Sounds good. What uh, plan? Any specific scopes you're planning on using it in? The uh, Skywatcher eight-inch f/4, the wide field. Um, mm -hmm. Probably use it on the uh, 
uh, what is that, uh, scientific, Explorer Scientific, AR-152. So a couple wide fields that I have, I'll use it on. So yeah, wherever the weather improves. If. Yeah, winter, winter in the Midwest. God, I gotta love it. Yeah, they gave me another 30 days trial on this thing. So it's funny that the weather has been horrid. Oh, you can send it back? Yeah. Yep. OPT uh, and Stalina both or Veonis or whatever the company's called, give uh, initially a 30 day money back. And then uh, I wrote to them after I think like two, two and a half weeks and sent them the pictures of the television set with the weather the way it was. And uh, OPT wrote back right away and said that they'd extended another 30 days. And Veonis wrote back and said they'd extended another 15. So uh, we'll see. I, I, I kind of, I didn't really threaten them. But what I said is the box has not even been opened yet. And I'd be more than happy to send it back right now. And they said, no, we'd, we'd be happy to extend it another 30 days. Huh. Well, that's funny. <clears throat> well, they don't stay in stock. They don't get too many of them, and they don't stay in stock. They make a backpack for it that uh, OPT's been out of them for a month. There's been a few other places that have got a backpack for it. And, uh, yeah. So, the, the objective lens on it, how big is it? It's only an 80 millimeter F6 doublet. Oh. Yeah, little. Is that an APO doublet? Like with the red, I mean, with the glass, it prevents the uh, fringing. Yeah. Yeah, it's not a triplet. They, they've got a, a light pollution on there, but what do they call the glass? Um, and and there, it's not true. They try to say that it's color free, and it's not. It really isn't. It, it's better than a normal doublet, but it's not near even a cheap triplet. Yeah, I was wondering how they got by with that. They got by with it because it's for people that don't know any better. So don't take a picture of Cirrus with it. Yeah, exactly. Or if they do, they think it's pretty colors. <laughs> yeah. Well, you you would think that that if it's an if it. If it's an 80 at F6, it's a wide angle. So you're not going to be taking pictures of, of really sharp, small objects. You're going to be taking nebulas and, and uh, possibly some globular clusters. Those may have some problem with fringing, but, uh, but most of the other stuff you probably won't be able to tell. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're exactly right, Sam. You're exactly right. And, and that's the funny thing. They've come right out and say it's not a planetary scope. Yeah, and definitely it, because no. Planet, uh, Saturn, on some of the pictures I've seen, you can barely tell there's rings. It looks like an oblong star. But the, 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 the funny thing is, is that almost every video you see, they try to do a planet with it. And it's like, you know, it's not for that. Why are you showing what the bad stuff is, you know? So it's, it's kind of funny. But anyway, yeah, I, I think that you're right that because of the type of scope it is being pretty wide field that, you know, you're not going to be taking pictures of star fields necessarily. Uh, but you'll be taking pictures of nebula mainly and in some uh, um, globular clusters, which some chromatic aberration would show. And you'd be taking pictures of galaxies. So. Hmm. So. so basically they just chip out on the scope so that they can give you all the other, you know, knickknacks that, so that they can sell it to you for $3,000 or whatever. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah, it's, it, does, it does its own plate solving. It, and like I said, camera rotator, do heater, uh, uh, plate solving it, it's all there but it, it, it's not there in a fashion that a pro would want 
and it, it's definitely not made for pros, but I'm trying to figure out who that niche market is. Uh, it, it's somebody that wants a quick setup uh, and snapshot quality, and they don't, they don't mind waiting an hour for that snapshot. Oh. Sounds like a very niche purchase. Yeah, uh, it, it's interesting looking in, in that you can, you know, control it remotely is a cool thing, but um, having to view that way is kind of marginal in my mind. I mean, it, it, it maybe, maybe this is a whole new type of market and a whole new type of uh, philosophy, and maybe there's somebody else that this is just exactly what they need. Um, I was almost wondering if this is something for a place like Wilton School System, where they don't have anybody at all that wants to learn how to run the gear. But if they only want to capture, you know, record the, the, an eclipse or something, you know, they could set it up there and press a button and tell it to go, you know, video the eclipse and it's done. They don't have to do anything. So I, I don't know. We'll, we'll, you know, we'll just have to see. And, and I'll keep you all posted and uh, hopefully... Uh, at one of our meetings, I'll be able to just set it up and we'll be able to screen share and, and mm. run it live right from a meeting. So, yeah, well, I mean, if somebody with money doesn't want to have to learn how to buy individual components, they are telling them everything that you need is in one unit. You can carry it in a backpack, set it up and start taking pictures. I mean, there's plenty of people out there that with the COVID has started getting into astronomy. And once they see the complexity of all the stuff that you want to do, if you offer them this, that is your market. You can do it with the 35 millimeter camera. You can, but, but you still have to buy a mount. Well, yeah, it would work. Well, yes, you have to track it. You have to track it, yeah. So this thing does a lot of stuff that that the average person doesn't want to have to learn. And the unfortunate thing is, it's really after you get the concepts on, it's really not all that hard. But I guess the problem is here in the Midwest, it might be a good thing because with the weather as crappy as it as it is, you forget how to use your gear in between uses. <laughs> At least I do. And then, but the other thing is, you're really not supposed to use this thing below freezing. So that knocks out, a, you know, a third of our year too. So, I mean. That's why um, I set up mine every once in a while. So I know how to use it. Yeah, yeah, you have to. I, I bought another mount. I bought an Ioptron uh, CEM60. It's a used one. It was a three hour drive down in Illinois. So I figured what the heck, I don't have to pay shipping or PayPal. So I'll just go down there and get it and bring it back. It's brand new. Uh, so the story goes that the uh, original owner passed away. So he had, he didn't even use it. So he had his, his club reach out on cloudy nights to sell it. So I got a pretty good deal on it. That's good. Mm -hmm. Do you have more mounts than telescopes now? I think I'm even. Okay, well then you 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 know it's time to buy another set. Well, I've I've also got on order a uh, APM uh, 100 uh, binoculars, so they're supposed to be in early March. Okay, now you need a paramount <laughs> or a what, par paragon paragon paragon. Now nah, paragon, I don't know if it's a. Uh... If it's that good for the size, because these things are big. The ones that it's buying are big. Okay. Oh, they're APM 100s. Yes. Yeah, so that, there's, there's two telescopes, right? Two 100 millimeter telescopes. Yeah, yeah that's pretty big. Binoculars. You need a paragon on each side. Yeah, I've got a 25 by 100 binoculars. They're Orions. They're huge. Yeah. Rusty, the, the telescope I got from you? Yeah. It's two of those. Oh, geez. That's a little bigger. <laughs> yeah. 
when they try well, mounts, you need EQ mounts for those. I, I bought a, a wood mount uh, overwork with a fluid mount head on it. But, I, but I've got other mounts that I can put it onto if I want to track stars or track anything. Now, is that a set magnification or can you put eyepieces in it? You can put eyepieces on it. Oh, there it, you come, go. it comes with a set of 18 millimeters, but you can put, I think they're inch and a quarter. You can switch them out. There you go. Yeah, look at those uh, Bader Zoom eyepieces. I'm not in favor of Zooms that much, but the Bader makes a great one. And then you've got uh, 8 to what? 8 to 24? 8 to 24, yeah. And then if, and you, get their, if you get their little, uh, whatchamacallit, so you can go down to what is it, 2 to 8? The Barlow? You the mean the Barlow? Barlow? Yeah, but, but, but the Barlow only works if you have a 2-inch eyepiece. I piece. I don't know. I thought that it worked. You put the two inch adapter on, then the Barlow fits in there, and then it's still one and a quarter. I think the Barlow is one and a quarter. The only thing you need the tube for is so that the Barlow screws in it or something like that. I had both. I just don't remember anymore. I had, I had, they are in the basement, but uh, I'll have to look. I've rebuilt a couple of telescopes this winter. Cool. I don't know if you can see them here. Yep. You won. This one over here is uh, an eight inch Mead LX200 GPS. And uh, that actually belongs to John Deere Middle School. And it was in pretty bad shape. It had, it had been, uh, it had led a very hard life at the middle school there. Put, I took it all apart and put steel gears in to replace the uh, plastic uh, gear drives on the uh, right ascension and declination drives because the plastic ones were, were uh, very, very badly stripped and it wouldn't uh, track right. Uh, the focuser was, damaged, broken pretty bad. I took that all apart and repaired that. Uh, put a nice uh, two inch uh, diagonal on it and uh, reprogrammed the uh, GPS so that it would work uh, because all the, uh, all the early Mead GPS uh, scopes ceased functioning after, uh, I forget what date it was when the GPS system changed their architecture. So uh, if you have a, a GPS, an older GPS, it probably won't work unless you, unless you reprogram it. So I got all that done. And uh, that's, a, that's a pretty nice little scope. I like that. It's, it's big enough to do some serious observing, but it's not too big that you can't haul it around easily. And then the other one here, this is actually Jim Rutenbeck's uh, LX200. It's, uh, a classic uh, 12 inch and uh, he was having problems with the uh, right ascension drive on that. I took all the electronics out of that and uh, shipped it over to a guy we know over by Detroit that uh, specializes in making repairs that the average uh, person like me that can use a soldering iron can't fix. So anyway, uh, uh, that's, I can't really test it because I don't have a scope to put on it, but uh, Jim, if, you, if you're on, still on the line there and you get back sometime, I'll well, put your scope on there and check it out, but I think it looks real good. Anyway, so they're not new. They're refurbished, I guess.
Uh, hi, Steve. What Steve is this? Van Hefty? Uh, Alan, uh, Jim is asking, do you have a cable required to update the LX200 GPM? Uh, to update the GPS? GP, I, I guess. I don't have a cable to do that. What I did, uh, and I've done this on, on the PACMO as well, I, I took the motherboard out of it and shipped it to this uh, this guy that uh, Jim and I know is over, over by Detroit, he has all the equipment and the computers and everything to flash the uh, software update. And uh, he just flashed the, the board for me and I just dropped it back in the scope and that, that took care of it. Costs less to uh, have him do it than to go get a cable. Unless, unless you can borrow one somewhere, but I don't have one. Mm -hmm. okay. Anyone else? Any new gear or selling any gear? I do want to make a comment. Um, if you know somebody who's is, uh, looking to, to buy a new telescope and, and not knowing what, you know, what size to buy, if they go to uh, Um, if they don't know what size of telescope they want to buy. Yeah. Um, oh, shoot. Tell them to go to the, uh, the Obsession Telescope site. Obsession Telescope site. Yeah, because they actually show the difference between like an eight inch what you see at a, uh, for a globular cluster in an eight inch scope versus like a 25 inch scope. Mm -hmm. one, you know, you, you think if you, if you get one that's twice the size, you're, you're gonna get twice the image and that isn't necessarily so. But anyway, it gives you an idea of, of what, what to expect and in telescope mirror sight. <clears throat> and I just thought that was kind of, you know, it's kind of interesting. Somebody's got a six inch, you know, it's like, gee, how big should I go? Well, you can, you can look at that and say, you know, hey, if I have this size telescope, this is the image. And so you might not necessarily want to go to a 20 inch when a 16 inch would do or a 12 inch. Yeah, that's just a comment. Hmm. Sounds handy. Yeah, there's a number of sites that you can go in also. And I was trying to find the one, it's like D string or something like that, that you can type in whatever telescope and whatever eyepieces or cameras you have. And you can compare different objects to different gear. And Stellarium does that too. We've got that set up on our scopes or on our uh, computers. Right. Anyone else? Rusty, did you want to talk about that? Some of that gear you have? Maybe we don't have to sell all of it on cloudy nights. Anybody need a finder scope? Okay, well, let me go. Let me go grab the box. Right. Anybody want a Newton or care to buy a Newtonian? What do you got? 
uh, Explorer Scientific uh, eight and a quarter inch. What do you want for the tube? Just the tube assembly? Yeah, so I bought it on a whim because I don't know, it just seems like I like to buy things to see them up close and see what they're like. Yeah, so it was a refurbished from uh, Explorer Scientific. What's the focal ratio? Uh, three, eight. That's a wide field then. Three, nine. What's your asking price on it? So if you just want the tube. $100. <laughs> I'll go $350. Okay, that's got, looks like it's got a, what's the focus so, look like on it? Your standard. Okay. Is it a two-speed focuser, Rolando? Yes. So yeah, it's the Explorer Scientific standard focuser? Yes, standard one. Didn't you buy an extra set of rings so you can rotate it? Oh well, yeah, I got another set of rings. I don't, I don't know, so. You just ask for the tube. The tube is just that. If you want the extra rings to keep it from sliding so you can rotate it around. I've also got the extra set of ring on here. And then I bought an adapter for the uh, for the finder scope so you don't have to use the Explorer Scientific one. You can just use the regular whatever dovetail type or Vixen type one. It's got the Vixen dovetail on it. Mm -hmm. Adapter. Okay, I do have a neighbor that's just getting into this, and I will mention that to him. I'm kind of watching out for scopes that would be reasonable, and he's wanting to do astrophotography, so I will mention that. So that's the Explore Scientific, eight, eight and a quarter. At three eight and a quarter. quarter. So it's uh, two ten millimeters. What's that? 205? 210. 210. And you're wanting 350 for the tube. Okay. If you, want, if you want some brackets, if he wants everything, what do I got here? I don't know. So the brackets were a hundred bucks. You can, I'll let those go. We can arrange something. Uh, does he need a columnator? I also bought a columnator for a laser one. Yeah, he might. I don't like say, I don't know what his budget is. I mean, he's going to need rings and a, and a dovetail. Uh, I think it'll come with that. What Rolando did is what I did with mine is I bought a second set of rings. Right. And so I could put it on and loosen up the one set so I could pivot the scope around so the eyepiece was in decent positions. So it would have the normal rings and dovetail. They're just not rotating rings. So why did it need refurbished? What was the problem with it? Nothing that they, uh, so if you go to the website, they'll have a, a column for clearance or refurbished ones. So the refurbished ones, I guess they just go through and I don't know if they were returned or what, but they'll just check them out. Uh, it's got a case on it. It's got the adapters on it. I, like I said, I've got the, I changed this out. It's, I've got the original one if he wants to use an Explorer sign scientific uh, finder scope, but that seems a little unique just to them. It so might have been just the, it might have been just a demo or open box too, because they, they call all that. Right, stuff exactly. Box. It could have been an open box. It's got the case and everything too. Okay, I'll run that past him, see what he says. It's got the wood case. It's got the uh, canvas case. Okay. Well, that's included in on it too? Yep. So we're talking like, okay, so the factory rings with the dovetail and the case, 350. With all together, I'll go 500. Oh, all together. Right, just the tube itself, I'll go 350. Not the rings. Well, I mean, it didn't come with factory, just regular rings on it? Or yeah, you it, had came to do with, it? it came with these rings. I purchased these separately, another set of rings. 
so that you can you can rotate it. Yeah, but it, for three fifty, you get a set of rings and a dovetail, right? Right. Yeah. So you can use it without the extra rings. Right. So yeah, that's I guess that's my question that he can mount that on a mount and not have to buy a set of rings for it. Yes, those come with okay. it. Okay. At the three fifty level. Correct. Okay. No finder scope. No finder scope. Okay. Can't buy one from Rusty. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, with the adapter, one of these will work because I got the I got three straight finders. They're all nine by fifty. Two of them are Celestron with the mounts, and one is an Orion with the mount. And the mount, the Orion mount, will work on that adapter. So, plus I got a brand new Celestron Sky Portal Wi Fi adapter, which I, I'm not going to use. <laughs> you got those finder scopes right there? Yeah. Are they illuminated? Yeah, there's one. They're brand new. All, they're all complete. Mounts and everything. So, Are they all straight through, Rusty? Yes, they're all straight through. Do any of them have the uh, LED illuminator on them? Nope. Okay. No, they do not. Well, I'll mention that all to that, my neighbor. We'll see. He had his car fixed. So I don't know how much pain he experienced with that. So, well, he can get a good price if he sell it, sold his car. <laughs> then he <laughs> can buy a nice good. house. You know, a lot of nice stuff. He wants to walk to work, though. Well, <laughs> you can pick him up, Jeff, and take him every day. I could do that. <laughs> yeah, a decent bicycle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Roller skates. Any other gear for sale? Any others? After this, Robert, the, can we do a little bit on observations? Because uh, I know Travis did some ob observations. And I know uh, Ellen did too, but Ellen's kind of hiding back there. Sure. Um, where, where should I put it on the agenda? How about right now? And then you can do your presentation. OK. So, what have people seen lately? Seen, photographed, uh, what are, anything? Yeah, Monday night, um, we were running errands, picking the baby up, and then uh, I got home and I saw that Orion was in a perfect spot in my backyard. There's uh, one dark portion um, in the southwest of my uh, house. So, even though the wind was blowing and it was chilly, I know... Uh, I haven't gotten the scope out for a few months, so I pulled it out and saw Orion's Nebula for the first time. Um, it was bright enough to see that I didn't even uh, struggle finding it. I didn't do the encoder or anything. I just kind of knew generally where it should be. Mm -hmm. And uh, it popped through right away. It was pretty exciting. Um, so I went in. I got my jacket, like two pairs of mittens, and I just shivered there and stared at it for a little bit. Um, definitely one of my favorite celestial objects for sure i like to see it in a true dark site um even in my backyard with the uh light pollution i mean it was pretty well defined i've seen like ring nebula and whirlpool and they're just kind of wishy washy out but orion seemed pretty well defined um it had a really clear shape and um i couldn't see any colors but i definitely saw contrast of kind of like more of a lighter hazy blue to a darker hazy blue it looked almost three-dimensional. It was just, I don't know, spectacular. You know, um, Orion, right before, is, Orion is like the Saturn of the nebulas. Once you've seen it, yeah. you're hooked forever. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, it definitely was one of my favorites for sure. Yeah, and you, right. you probably won't see a lot of color. Our eyes aren't really attuned to, uh, what do they call it, rods and cones in our eyes don't do much. The rods are more light sensitive than the cones are. Yeah, that's why in really dim light, everything looks black and white. Sure. 
Yeah, I, I've heard some people with some scopes can see like a hint of color on Orion. Um, so I didn't really go in with that expectation, but just uh, the the shape of it was so much more uh, defined than what I'm used to seeing, especially from my backyard. Um, while I had the scope out, I threw the uh, lunar polarizer on and saw the moon. It was almost full. I think it was like at 96 or 97 percent. So took a look at some of the, the valleys there. But um, then I just went back to Orion before I uh, decided to go inside before I got some frostbite. It was chilly. I Frost. wish it was a night like last night. Last night was beautiful, but it was too cloudy. So, you know, you can never get it perfect. Awesome. Yes. Good time. Right. Any other any other interesting observations? Oop, you're still muted, Ellen. There you go. Yeah, want to see the sun today? Sure. Uh, let's see. I guess I can't. Wait a minute. Hang on. Uh, I don't know why. I just won't. I can't get it to default to everyone being able to share screens. Anyway, try it now. Okay, I think it'll work now. Cool. Okay, that's today. That was uh, about 11 o'clock this morning. And uh, this picture, actually, I shot this with the 12 inch uh, PACMO telescope. So this is this is the scope we use in our mobile observatory with the DSLR. And I shot it as monochrome and then I went back and uh, colored it. I think monochrome images are maybe just a little sharper. And uh, you might notice uh, the other thing is you, you might be able to see some lines in here and that's because uh, with a focal length of 3048 millimeters you can't get the whole sun in one picture so there's actually four snapshots I weave together there and you and I tried to hide the overlaps but you can still see it a little bit uh, but these these two sunspots over here are rotating towards us now and I think over the next few days you're going to see them rotate out here with where maybe there'll be another solar flare, maybe if we're lucky. <laughs> Ends in your definition of luck. <laughs> or unlucky. <laughs> uh, I've got some other pictures here. E each of these, each of these pictures are like just a few days different. So this was like on the 14th. Uh, that's the 13th. Well here, now you can see between the, uh, 13th and the 14th one day you can see how far the sun rotates in one day mm -hmm. and there, there's been some some nice uh nice sunspots there, there's a, a nice cluster there big ones there yeah quite a quite a few sunspots we're in into an active cycle now i think Anyway. Cool. You should archive these. Maybe. Yeah. Valuable to professionals. Wayne, Wayne Jens used to do regular sketches of sunspots. We got file cabinet drawers full of his sketches. If you took I, one of those uh, sunspot circles, there's two of them there on the far left. <laughs> you that to what the size it would be in relation to like Jupiter or Earth or anything like that. Uh, it's interesting that you uh, you would say that. Uh, let me see here. Okay, see that picture there? 
Yep. Uh, let's see here. Let me uh, see if I can enlarge that. Uh, oh, wait a minute. I, I didn't want to do that. Hang on. Wrong thing's moving. I don't know if you can see it there. See the earth? Yeah. So I put the earth. Obviously, you'd never see the earth. In a, in a picture like this, that, that close to the sun, but uh, uh, that's approximately, I, I could be a little off, but that's approximately the scale. So these are planet sized or, or, you know, this cluster itself is probably 50 to 100,000 miles across actually. So it's, <laughs> it's you're, you're in the ballpark, yeah. Yeah, it's humbling. So the one sunspot could be the size of Earth. Yep. Well, at least something to do in the winter time so that you don't have to mess around out in the dark. Well, actually, it's really nice. I just walk out on the front porch that faces to the south. Yeah. And it's warm, even in the, you know, January, it's warm when you go out on the porch and the sun's shining. So <laughs> yeah. it's, it's better than going out when it's below zero. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, sun's getting higher, the days are getting longer. So that's a good thing. Yep. All right. Anyone else? So then anyone wants to, does anyone want to see what the Celestia is I'm talking about? Yep. Presentation time. All cool. right. Absolutely. So I learned about this from an online article in Sky and Telescope. Mm -hmm. Celestia is a planetarium software with a twist. It lets you view the stars, view the constellations, view planets from any vantage point in space, not just from Earth. In fact, this is the this is the opening screen right here. This is okay. Oh, okay, hang on. Let me. Where are you? Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. Let me share my screen here. There. Yeah, can you see that? Yes. Sure yep. can. Okay. So this is the basically the home screen for this. this is what did you get when you first open it up this is a view of earth from 31,891 kilometers above showing you basically you've got the sun right behind you and this is you staring right at earth at this particular time let's see what's it saying here Okay, so right now it's I've got the clock set on uh, local standard time, which is all right. And so you can see the glow on the Earth where the sun's facing you, where the sun is facing. And then, so let's see, introduce you to some of the features here. Is that live weather or is that just like a stock photo? Um, I'm guessing a stock photo. So let's see if you right-click hold your mouse, you can orbit around the Earth, in whichever you like, and you can see which constellations are right behind the Earth from the point of view of, again, the sun is directly behind you in this vantage point. So if I orbit this way, yep, there's North America right there. And you can well, basically, whichever way you move over your mouse, you can orbit the Earth in any direction you like. Yeah. 
And then let's see if you left click the mouse, what is again? This changes the direction that you're, you, you hold still and this changes the direction you're looking at. I'll just get around just right. Not moving it. Maybe there's somewhere. I'm trying to find where the sun is. Well, actually, here. Uh, over the top menu here, the navigation tab. So you can, well, yeah, that didn't work. I'll say, if you click on select object, and so I select the sun, and now go to center selection, and there, that shows me which way the sun is from the point of view of Earth. Now, I haven't seen a feature on this allows you to telescope toward the view, but you can move toward it by rotating your uh, here. Oh, that's Earth. I'm moving away from the sun instead. So I, there you go. Okay. All right. So. All right, let's let's start this again. So go into the navigation tab and you can see a bunch of different selections here. Uh, select Sol, looks like I'm one of the uh, tour guide. This gives you a drop down menu with some popular choices. So let's say you want to select Jupiter and then you click on go to and hang on tight. And there you go. Click on OK, and now we're just under 300,000 kilometers from Jupiter. And you see there's got there's like a in, little in, set of info up here. It shows you how far your vantage point is from it. it, shows the radius of the object you're looking at, its apparent diameter, so how wide it appears to be from your distance from it. Here's the rotation period, if you're interested in that thing. Now, let's see. Now that we're at Jupiter, let's take a look around here and see if, well, of course the constellations are gonna look the same as they do from here. Uh, another try, but thing I've been trying to find if there's a way to change the, uh, change the, God, I'm blanking on the term, a field of view. Um, still looking for that. Um, let's see from here. Okay, so I just selected Rigel. And so it gives you some information on that. It's absolute magnitude. It gives you the apparent magnitude as seen from your vantage point. What class of star it is, how wide it is, and gives its rotation period. Well, what's what rotation period comes into this? Let's see here is Canopus. That's a star we don't get to see from this latitude very much. Oh, and it also tells you how far away that selected object is, in this case, 309 light years. Let's see. Sirius. It's interesting here, it tells you a star system bearish center. It does that every time you select, uh, say, a binary star. So in other words, you have to be specific. If you want the actual star, you have to be specific in exactly where you point and click, or you have to have to go into navigation. And um, so going back to navigation, you click on select object. Here you can be specific. We're at Jupiter, so let's pick Io. And then click on navigation again, you can go to object. No, no, not, not, okay, that, that would, so, all right, well, let's see, if you click on go to, ah, there you are. And let's see, all right, if you rotate the wheel on your mouse, you can zoom in or zoom out. 
And you see that they use some or up to date uh, observations of these objects to fill in what they what they would look like. It looks like a COVID. <laughs> so the overbaked pizza reference is out now, and COVID's in, huh? Furball. Furball. And then let's see. Let me select Jupiter. And now I'll pick center selection. So we're still at Io. This is how big Jupiter would appear from Io. I'm gonna go back to Earth so that I can uh, demonstrate another feature here. Go to selection in your navigation in, and there we are again. And I just want to quick go over here to the time. If you go down here and let's, I need to move a few things here. Um, so under the time tab, you can pick select time, set time. And that lets you change the time showed on the, uh, on the Celestia window here to whatever date you like. I'm doing this to demo, uh, demonstration I'm gonna do here is, so let's see, I'm gonna pick, I'm gonna pick, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick, I'm gonna try to pick, there we go. 8th of April, 2024. And let's see, what time I guess, let's try local time. All right, we'll try local time of noon. And let's see what happens here. Um, that can't be right. Hold on a minute. Uh, I'll, try, I'll try it in universal time. So you can just set this die to show local time or universal time. But I do remember that what I was going to show you is about 1900 universal time, I think. Oh, that's the April 8th on that time. And now let me rotate around. On where, ah, there you are. April 8th, 2024, the next total solar eclipse in the United States. That's the moon shadow right there. Cool. It's very cool. And let's see if I can find it. it may take a while. There's you. There you are. Okay. Yep. There's the moon approaching the sun. Now let's see. I need to get time going, going a little bit faster here. Or maybe I passed it, hang on. Uh, let's see, set time. Let's bring that back an hour, let's see. Bring it back another hour. Hmm, okay, well. Anyway, there I'll force I'll force the eclipse to happen. All right. And let's see. Second to real time. Start it up again. All right. And okay, going back to the navigation tab, uh, follow selection, sync orbit selection tracks, solar system browser. So pick your favorite planet. Saturn, of course. All right. Uh, and let's go there. Let's 
zoom out a bit. And whoop, no, not, not that. All right. You can see Neptune in the background. Let's see what about the, whoop. looks like there's a moon down here. What is that? Tethys. Now, let's see what other this is a Titan. There you are. Ooh. Okay, sometimes sometimes zooms in a little too much there. Let's see. And that's how big Saturn would look from Titan. And then I'll come to now star browser. It lists the, according to the documentation, it lists the hundred closest individual stars to earth. So you could pick any one of these and go to it. Let's try. Alpha Centauri A. Hang on tight, folks. Ah, oh, we can get closer than that. There we go. Oops, maybe not that close. All right. So we just entered the Alpha Centauri A system. And now I'm gonna, let's see. One thing I've always wanted to know. For one thing, do they have to use the, uh, this one here? How bright does Alpha Centauri B look like from A? Oof. So that's where B is. It looks like a smack dab in the middle of the handle of the Little Dipper. We just confirmed it because that's Polaris. Okay, so yeah, from Alpha Centauri A, Alpha Centauri B, well, at least at the moment, would be there. And look at its apparent magnitude, minus 19. That's like at least a million times brighter than the full moon appears from Earth. So it would literally be a second star in your sky. And now, select the sun, center on that. And there's where our sun would be in Alpha Centauri sky, right next to Cassiopeia. And it'd be fairly bright too, just a little bit brighter than first magnitude. So yeah, with this and with the constellation line selected, you can see how the constellations would change depending on where you were in, uh, in space. Now from Alpha Centauri, okay. Does anybody recognize this constellation here? Buddha, no. I'll give you a hint. That's his brightest star right there. So that's Auriga, and from Alpha Centauri, it looks like somebody punched his nose in. Orion's still at, whoop, wait a minute, except, oh, there's Sirius way up there near, uh, near Orion's, look, look at that, from Alpha Centauri, Sirius and Betelgeuse are right next to each other.
Can you believe, can you believe that? Looks like Canis Major sticking his nose right into Orion's armpit. Now let's go to Sirius and see how things look from there. I'll select Sirius A just to be specific. All right, hold on. Okay, here we are. Now, where is the sun from this place? Magnitude two. That's the sun, what, which constellation is it in? Looks like it's just off Aquila. And then this up here, that is Lyra with Vega right there. So you can see how the constellations are starting to get distorted. And oof, look at Hercules. The keystone is now a triangle. Um, I'm not going to hog all the fun here. If some, somebody want to select a, choose a star. Can you call up the Garnet? The Garnet star? Uh, let's see. Um, um, not by that name. Maybe you need to give its catalog designation. Let me see. It does, it does have a pretty extensive star catalog in this. Maybe you just have to get the name right. Uh, let's see. Hold on here. All right. Uh, Garnet star. also known as Mu Cephi. Let me try that name. Ah, there we go. Okay. Let's see. Center selection. Or how, how far away is it? 1800 kiloparsecs. Oh, this ought to be good. Let's go there. All right. So we just entered the system of the Garnet Star. And now let's take a look back and see where the sun is. The sun is magnitude 16 from this location. There you go. Those are all our constellation lines there. All the constellations we know crammed into that one little piece of sky. We're almost two, we're almost 2000 light years from Earth at this location and well, you can see for yourself. Look around here. See if there's anything we recognize. So what's this one? Mu Sagittarii. Ooh, what's that one? Alpha Camelopardulus. Ooh, oh, we got. Hmm. Huh. We got a second magnitude star from this sky. So yeah, from this point is point, suddenly you got a whole bunch of new, relatively bright stars to explore. What's this one up here? Nine Cephei, Cepheus. There's the center of our galaxy. And I thought this is very interesting. It, prominently shows you the Sagittarius dwarf 
galaxy, which is currently being eaten by our Milky Way galaxy. This one. E. Signy. Well, I'm going to go back to Saul here. And let's see, there was, you don't have to just click on the navigation, select go to object. If you press the G key, so if you just press G on your keyboard, that will also go to the object. I'm gonna go back here because I wanna demonstrate this Eclipse Finder option in navigation. So this will give you the dates for when solar and or lunar eclipses are gonna occur for your selected objects. So right now it's on earth and it's giving you a window of, what's it say, April 8th, 2023 to 2025, I think. Press compute. And there are, yep, there are the solar eclipses. Let's select this first one, April 20th, 2023. And set date and go to planet. Let's see what happens. And it looks like that's where this solar eclipse is happening on that particular date, April 20th of next year. We turn around toward the sun. There's Sagittarius dwarf again. I don't know you're there. Yep, there we go. Yep, there's the moon partially covering the sun. Now, let's look at Jupiter here. It's just computed when a whole bunch of solar eclipses are going to occur for the planet Jupiter due to some of its moons. Looks like we got a couple co coming up on April 21st of this year. Let's try Europa. And there's Europa's shadow on Jupiter. So it gives you the date, start time, and duration. Um, I think this defaults to universal time when it does this. So yeah, this will tell you when moon shadows will be visible on Jupiter at these times. That's really cool. Yep. This is Europa. Uh, let's see. A couple of days later, Ganymede's going to do it. There's, did it work? Let me try that again. Maybe you double click, okay. So if you double click on it, that works too. And let's see. If I can find one, it's rare, but does it happen when you have two moon shadows on a, on a planet at the same time? Let's see. Well, but yeah, you can have quite a bit of fun doing this. Let's see. It also gives you for Saturn. Let's see what that does. Iapetus, Tethys, Dione, Rhea. Hmm. Tethys is closer to Saturn than... Uh, Well, let's see. Well, it looks like Tethys' shadow is too small to show up on Saturn. Well, anyways, oh well. But if we turn around, let's see. Now you can see how close Mercury, Earth, and Venus, and Mars are to the sun from the point of view of Saturn. 
let's see. So can okay, release center on Tethys. Yeah, that's not right. Oh well. Hmm. All right, well. Anybody want to choose another destination? Can you see relative size of galaxies from galaxies? Like, can you see the size of Andromeda from Triangulum or something like that? You want to try going to another galaxy? Well, I've never. All right. Well, let's see what happens. Let me let me try Andromeda here. Galaxy. Oh, fine. Just. Hmm. Oh, right. M thirty M thirty one. No. No. Maybe it doesn't do extra galactic yet. Oh, thanks for trying. Oh. Large Magellanic Cloud. Oh, we can we can select that one. All right. Let's see what happens. Oh my gosh, here we are. Just 400 light years in the center of the Large Magellanic Cloud. Let's take a look back. Well, we can see the Milky Way from here. Sagittarius again. You would think let's see. So that's how the small Magellanic cloud would look from the large one. And ooh, oh, okay. I'm looking at the edge of the uh, LMC. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> huh. Oh, there's M31. Okay, you can select it. I guess you have to include the space between the M and the 31. All right, well, so there's M31. Hold on tight. That didn't work, hang on. Okay, fine. Warp speed. Oh, okay. Uh, it looks like we're hovering about 60,000 parts. Still hovering 60,000 parsecs from it. Now let us uh, see what the sun looks like from here. Look how tiny it's got the Milky Way looking. No. So I'll give it a couple million years. The, the, yes, that's yes, a few billion years in there. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. I think we can get this to work now. So that's how big M33 Triangulum would look like from Andromeda. Hard to tell where it is in relation to the Milky Way, though. Let's go there. And I imagine that's from the core of Andromeda, right? Um... I think we were still hovering just outside it at that point, but there's M33. And see, if you, if you look up here, 16.48 kiloparsecs, this is how far our vantage point is from it in the simulation. Now we go back to look back at M31. Ah. So from Triangulum, M31 looks like it's just about face on. 
very cool. Yep. And I wonder, does it recognize the name Milky Way? It does. And Milky Way looks really tiny from that vantage point from the view of Triangulum. So I guess this is, an, this is an indication of how much closer to Andromeda the Triangulum Galaxy is. That'd be cool at some time to see if it shows uh, Andromeda running into the Milky Way. Mm. That'd be pretty spectacular. I think you'd set the time to about four or five billion years in the future. Maybe it would. <coughs> well, just a few more things here. Under the render tab, you can, among things you, yeah, under, go under <coughs> the render tab to view options, you can control like which things will have labels and which won't, whether you want to show the diagrams, the constellations, or the what kind of labels you want, which things you want labeled, and so on. So this is like the utility. So it's, it's kind of the same options you get in Stellarium to show you just how much detail you want to see and see in everything. Well, what do you think? So I saw there's an option for spacecraft. So you could look at planets from the vantage of the ISS then, right? Uh, let's see, spacecraft, orbits, labels, maybe. That'd be kind of neat. Let's see. Uh, so let's head back to Earth. Why do we go to M31? All right, how about the sun then? I think we got lost there for a minute. And here we are, okay. Now, let's head to Earth. Now, let's see. Oh, there's the Hubble. Oh yeah, yep. There's Hubble. So that's here. I wonder if, yes, ISS is in the list. Let's oh, go cool. to it and see where it is. Well, that's cute. It's got the photo of it. Yep. And let's see. Where's Earth? Where's Earth in all this? There's Earth. So what do you think? <coughs> Looks fun. Yeah, I think it's pretty neat. And it's free software. You just go to celestia.space and you can download it from there. What is that version 1622? Uh, let's see. I see there's two of them, but it, I think just maybe under. Uh Yep, I've got 1.6.2.2. And there's there's the website. Yep. Hmm. Yes, it has no warranty. So if you use it to plan a trip and you get lost, you're on your own. <laughs> It does look Pretty like nice. they have an Android app. That's pretty neat. Yep. Any, any questions about it? Any, 
And if you do have any questions, please bear in mind, I only just discovered this a week or so ago, and I've only been playing around with it for a few days. So I can't guarantee I can answer your questions. Well, with that, I want to say, since you can't, since you gave the presentation, Robert, thank you so much. It's a good presentation. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. So, oh. right. Okay. Well, we're getting on a quarter to nine here, so we better finish up the meeting here. So, let's get to the treasurer's report. Sam? Uh, it hasn't changed much since the last time. We've had a couple of uh, due payments. Uh, let's see. So the general fund uh, right now is at 22.48.42. Mm -hmm. The event fund is at 327.30. And the observatory relocation is at uh, 39, 547, 78 for a total of 42, That's the size of it. Yep. We have a motion to approve the treasurer's report. So moved. Any seconds? No second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The board is approved. All right. Um, any updates to the observatory relocation project? <coughs> Bless you. I, uh, pending weather, I'll be going out to Wilton Observatory tomorrow after work. Uh, I boxed up their broken camera and they said they'll send it back to Attic. So uh, I'll be taking that out there. And while I'm out there, I'll probably spend a half an hour making sure everything still runs because it's been a month since I've been out there. All right. Uh, Byron, are, are you trying to say something? You're muted. No? Oh, okay. So, Mike, are you are you trying to say something? There, I think we're we're free now. So we're we're going over the updates on the latest, from what I know, on the observatory relocation, mm -hmm. and, and um, I did uh, <coughs> ask the field people. And at the last board meeting, we came up with that they wanted way too much money at uh, Ryerson. And I'm in search of trying to find another source to, to pick up the steel. And um, I also took and got a hold of Dan, our concrete guy, and I told him that I felt like we had enough money to take and um, uh, go ahead with the concrete and get that part done in the spring. And I asked him a time frame. I was trying to hold him down to, you know, being realistic with him to get catch up, caught up, but this is a lot bigger project, more money involved. So he thought for sure he could get it done by the middle of June. Um, and he said though, before we start, he said, there's been an increase, of course, in steel and the concrete, and he wants to re 
bid it and he's supposed to have the bid out here uh, sometime in the next day or so. So uh, I'll be waiting for that and uh, present that at the next board meeting coming up. And uh, then let's see. Um, the other things, um, there's, there's another item I was going to mention. Um, well, like I said, we need, we probably have enough money or close to it for the material package, but we're going to be short on the actual construction part. And I need to look at a contractor that can look at Scott. Um, plan that Jim ordered and got uh, on the observatory. So uh, we will take and um, uh, continue to see if I can find carpenter contractor that feels comfortable with getting that uh, uh, all installed and done. Um, on Dan's part, he said that he would give us a bid for the footings and then the eight inch thick walls, four foot tall, four inch slab inside with six piers uh, for the roll off posts to support the roof. So he will give us options as far as what we want uh, as far as uh, piers. I said just bid them separately each one and then if we want to go with two or three or whatever we can dial that into it so um uh that was some of the stuff that's taken place lately and also one other thing i did get a hold and talk to uh, uh baker jim baker on uh, or john baker on the um, electrical because when the frost comes out of the ground, uh, which will probably be in April, that we can think about getting the power ran down from the Minky roll off to the dome building that we moved December 20th. And um, John felt like he, he was capable of doing that and we'd survey it all out to make sure, but uh, he didn't see any problem and we'll have to get about 150 foot, I believe of uh, Romex underground. And I did get a bid on from k, &K Hardware that it would cost about $75 to take and uh, rent a trencher that can go anywhere from an inch or two deep up to five or six inches deep. And it's $75 for a day to rent that machine. So there's some up and coming things, but again, we're waiting for weather and uh, we'll see where the price is. Uh, I think Jim had the original prices maybe at hand, uh, Rudenbeck, about where Dan had bid that uh, hardcore foundation with the frost footings of uh, four foot tall by eight inch wide walls with the four inch uh, slab in the piers. And don't quote me on this, but I think it might have been around 13,000, but I, I'm not sure. But Dan did say there was some increases in cement the first of the year and the uh, steel rebar. So um, that's my report on the latest that I know, and <clears throat> I will continue to work on the steel. When it also starts getting warm, we'll start seeing if we can take the rest of the cave mount apart and proceed with that too. So I think that includes everything that I wanted to uh, bring up. Okay. Could you send me an email with uh, some of this in writing? I'd for my own part, I need to start working on a progress report to uh, RDA. Let them know what progress we made on the grant they gave us, what we've done so far, and what we've got going, what we've got 
set down to do in the in the next few months. So you want me to give you uh, a little more of a written detail in an email as far as uh, what what we got planned for the new roll off building. So I can have the notes on hand for when I write my report. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, that, we'll see if we can get that to you this week. That'd be a great help. Thanks. Yeah. So even though it's winter, I've been slowly trying to keep things going a little bit. And I think the biggest thing will be is uh, the two things that, that are going to be the biggest holdup will be is getting a contractor uh, found that is capable of doing the carpentry work and building the roll off and um, getting the uh, materials uh, lined up to, um, you know, and also we should, if I'm out to Menard, I try to get a lumber cost mm -hmm. on 24 by 30 uh, building with a hip roof and we'll have to try to figure out the hardware. And we got some that we could use if we could match it up with what we took from uh, the Sherman Parks roll off. Jim, okay. are you here? Jim? Uh, oh, Jim, he's he's on his cell phone and he's said he was having trouble being heard over it. Okay. All so right. Ch check, check your chat room, Mike. That's how he's getting in touch with us. Okay. So I don't see anything there. Um, but anyway, um, you know, like I said, we're getting to the point where we're two thirds through uh, February. So um, still got a little ways to go. It's supposed to be below normal. Uh, temperatures the last week of February into the first two weeks of March from the farm report that was released uh, less this past Saturday and they have some some accuracy to it so uh, I think we're going to be around the 30 40 here for the next week or so and then we're going to get a little chilly for a while and hopefully maybe he didn't have anything farther out than about the second week of March so Hopefully um, uh, we don't get a bunch of snow yet in March or something like that. We've had, we haven't quite had the moisture precipitation. We're kind of still feeling the drought even in the winter time here this year still. So um, we need the moisture, but it'll help us get going sooner if the weather cooperates. Right. Okay. Um, something else? Uh, yeah. When's the next board meeting? Next board meeting is March 2nd. Okay. I want to make sure I got that. Yep. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, we're running short of time, so I'm, I'll make a motion to table any uh, discussion on maintaining our social media until the next board meeting or general meeting. Okay. And I'll second that if needs a second. All right. So then real quick, is there any other business that we should bring up tonight? Going once, going twice, going twice and a half, twice and three quarters. There's nothing else. Does anyone want to make a motion? Well, 
Uh, first, again, our next board meeting is March 2nd, and our next general meeting is March 21st. Um, what do you got there, Jim? Um, we're going to a star party near Tampa. Course that cast is clear each of five nights, high in the 80s, low 60. We all hate you, Jim. <laughs> I'll second that motion. <laughs> All right. Does anyone want to make a mo does anyone want to make, <laughs> make to, if there's nothing else, does anyone want to make a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. I have a motion from Cecil. You have a second. Second. Byron seconds. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Who cares? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. Oh, and, and uh, before we leave, I do want to ex extend our best wishes to Derry, Terry Dufek. I understand he's not not feeling as well as he was not any 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 updates about him has Russell. returned and it's it's um growing rapidly uh, well i believe he's entered hospice correct no yeah oh he has no, uh, he's, he's, he's got gonna, hospice care coming to his house yeah he's okay. staying he's going to stay in his in his home as long as possible but he's has uh, people coming in every day to help him out twice a week yep mm. well we'll all hold good thoughts for him all right good good meeting everyone yep, yep. thank you yep. Yep. And jeff good give me a call you. wednesday jeff you're muted again thanks we'll do rusty all right. All right. Uh, Good night, everyone. See you. See you.